Hi, my name is Tim Sassine. I'm the Market Development Manager for Ballard for the United States. And today I'd like to talk to you about transit total cost of ownership and the California Innovative Clean Transit Rule, how fuel cells are proving their market in this heavy duty application. For those of you unfamiliar with Ballard, we are the world leader in proton exchange membrane fuel cells. We've been around for about four decades when we're approaching about a thousand employees in global locations around the world, working in buses, trucks, trains, and ships, and material handling. Our fuel cells are going out by the hundreds of megawatts and are surviving in the, in the field in real trials, accumulating over 30 million kilometers of field experience to date and surviving over 30,000 hours, meeting the demands of high usage, heavy duty applications. Today, we'd like to answer the question, what would happen if an entire heavy duty market segment went to zero emissions? In the case of transit in California, this is about over 10,000 vehicles going to zero emissions within a decade. California's innovative clean transit regulation intends to do just that. By 2040, all buses on the road in California must be zero emissions. And in order to accomplish that, by 2029, only zero emission buses will be procured. And this has ramifications across all operations in transit from the depot out to the bus stop. Transit is an excellent proving ground for zero emissions and indeed has been blazing the trail for the past two decades. Now moving aggressively into innovative clean transit rule, transit is again proving its ability to be flexible, nimble, and at the edge of zero emissions technology. These decades of experience have provided real meaningful real world data to assess what a full fleet transformation will cost and what its operational impacts will be across an entire industry and across both fuel cell electric and battery electric technologies. Part of the innovative clean transit rule is the innovative clean transit rule rollout plan. This is mandated by the California Air Resources Board for every transit agency in California. And in fact, this year they are due for large transit agencies of 65 or more in the Central Valley or the San Joaquin Valley. And for agencies of 100 buses or more elsewhere. These zebra rollout plans have nine different sections, some of which are deeply technical, including their technical portfolio and their future bus procurement plans. In order to accomplish meaningful rollout plans, which the transit agencies can base their future planning on, agencies have enlisted third party technical consultants from a variety of areas such as CTE, STV, WSP, Zen, many others to name a few. These third party consultants are providing unbiased assessments of true costs for all areas of operations for these transit agencies and identifying what the costs will be for both the stakeholders and for the riders themselves. The rollout plans that have been submitted so far to CARB represent a good cross section of the transit agencies. While the rollout plans were due in July of this year, according to the original regulation, events such as the COVID pandemic and other operational concerns have delayed most agencies. However, the 10 agencies that have submitted are shown here and they represent about a third of the rolling stock moving around in California right now for transit. These agencies include Santa Monica, Orange County, Omnitrans in Riverside, Foothill Transit, Sunline Transit in the Palm Desert, Golden Empire Transit in Bakersfield, AC Transit, San Joaquin RTD in the Central Valley in Stockton, Long Beach Transit, and North County Transit District in my home county of San Diego. You can find all of these rollout plans and you'll find more as they come out on the Air Resources Board website under the Innovative Clean Transit Regulation. Total cost of ownership has become the go-to metric for cost effectiveness for zero emission bus technology in transit in California. There's four primary components to TCO, and that's bus, maintenance, infrastructure, and fuel. And you can look at those further subdivided as capital costs and operating costs for bus and for the energy that it uses. On the bus side, capital costs are obvious. They're the bus purchases themselves, be they fuel cell electric or battery electric. The operating costs for these assets are the bus, the bus maintenance, both preventative and corrective maintenance that the bus undergoes, and midlife refurbishment for the power plant. 
On the fuel side, since these buses don't run off of natural gas, diesel, or gasoline, they need new energy supplies. On the hydrogen side, that means fuel storage and dispensing. For electrical, that can mean electrical distribution within the transit agency, the chargers themselves, and the pantograph machines that connect the buses. Operating costs, again, are obvious. They're the hydrogen fuel sold by the kilogram to the agencies using it, and the electrical rates that the investor-owned utilities charge to the agencies, along with the various service fees that they incur. Starting off with bus purchase costs, the purchase price for a fuel cell electric bus has changed quite dramatically over the past 15 years or so. Way back in 2010, we saw a cost of $2 million for the 20 buses that went to the Vancouver Olympics. Whereas in 2016, the most recent buses that went on the road were just over 1.2 million that went to AC Transit Orange County and Sunline. Last year, the California Department of General Services issued a zero emission bus RFQ, and they had submittals from two different manufacturers, Proterra and New Flyer, and these buses provide the comparison between the two technologies. The New Flyer Charge H2 bus most directly compares with the Proterra loaded up with 660 kilowatt hours of battery. And while this may not quite make the range of the New Flyer Charge H2, it is the closest comparison. And we could see that the prices were quite similar uh, within 11% for a six year warranty for those buses and even closer within 2% for a 12 year warranty price or an almost negligible price difference between the two. If we look at the ICT rollout plans, we see this cost similarity between the different plans with the, the overlap between the costs more great than the extreme spreads at the far ends. Infrastructure costs for both battery electric and fuel cell electric have been predicted by the graph that you see here that we presented in, in many different occasions and many others have as well that for small fleet sizes, you'll see real cost advantages for battery electric buses. Whereas as the fleet increases, your marginal cost for each additional bus will decrease with fuel cell electric buses. Whereas with battery electric buses, those upstream impacts add a increasing marginal cost to growing fleet sizes. As we look towards the ICT rollout plans, we see Sunline illustrating this low cost for the battery electric buses with 64K a bus for something like 14 buses, whereas the fuel cell buses were over 200K for a fleet of around 35. However, as we scale, we look at the transit uh, assessment from Foothill in the most recent review of their bus procurements. And fuel cell electric buses there showed costs of about 133K per bus for fueling infrastructure compared to almost three times that for the battery electric bus. Long Beach saw a similar sort of result with 108K per bus for 125 buses and almost double that for 100 buses on the battery side. AC Transit saw that even further improve with their assessment for 200 buses hitting $90,000 per bus for fueling infrastructure, whereas for the battery electrics for well over 500 buses hitting well past half a million per bus. North County illustrates the difference between different transit agencies in the various idiosyncrasies that affect cost. Their costs were somewhat higher than the other agencies, but still they show this cost advantage in going to fuel cell electric buses with their higher deployments of over 150 buses with about a third less cost than the battery electric equivalent. As we look at operating costs, we have to look at fuel. And for hydrogen fuel, that has been uh, an area of concern by many transit agencies all along. We're seeing costs of around 740 a kilogram. And these costs are set to decline as other users come online. You may have noticed in the news, there's increasing coverage over hydrogen, not just in transportation, but in other areas of the economy that seek to decarbonize. Transport, as you can see here on this graph from the International Energy Agency, only comprises a very small amount of the hydrogen that's used today. Uh, other industrial uses, such as for fertilizer and for steel making and other uh, refining operations use far more hydrogen. And you can see proportionally the amount that's electrolyzed today is quite small. All industry indications are that the lowest cost hydrogen is in fact going to be that made from renewable energy production, particularly as renewable energy costs decline over time as they're expected to do. At the same time, we're seeing dramatic improvements in fuel economy 
Whereas the buses just a few years ago were getting something like seven miles per kilogram of hydrogen. Today we're seeing fuel efficiencies of 8.6 miles per kilogram or more, something like a 20% improvement. And this leads to a cost per mile for fuel of something like 86 cents a mile. This can be comparable to what some agencies see depending on their electricity rates. Recently, Foothill released an analysis showing that for their battery electric buses, they were costing them something like 76 cents a mile within striking distance for fuel costs for the battery buses. We also know that while hydrogen costs are going to be declining as larger scale renewable hydrogen production ramps up for multiple industry sectors, that grid electricity is going to become more expensive as grid infrastructure becomes more expensive. Even today, we're suffering through rolling blackouts and wildfire induced outages across California. We know that this is gonna require increased infrastructure investment by the utilities, both for the poles and wires and for storage for variable renewable energy resources that we're going to have to increase over time. All of these will have to be borne by the ratepayers as the grid is faced with these challenges moving forward. And that charge will be seen by those using the battery electric buses as well. Service is the other operating cost that's on the bus side of things, and we've seen great progress as well in service costs for the fuel cell electric buses. Early deployments such as the Van Hool buses at AC Transit have been legendary for their reliability and for their technicians' ability to keep those buses on the road even as manufacturers change. However, it came at a price with over a buck sixty a mile for service costs for those buses. Buses that were deployed at Sunline and Orange County rapidly brought those costs down. And today we see those costs really on par with what's seen for compressed natural gas, uh, both at Sunline and for that estimated at Foothill as well. Battery electric buses have a wide variety of different operating costs, depending on the reliability of the bus and the bus manufacturer and on the facilities that are at the disposal of the agency. What's not included in total cost of ownership are the other operational concerns, and these turn out to be quite considerable for most transit agencies. Operational flexibility is a huge concern for most transit agencies having very limited windows for refueling their buses and for performing the necessary maintenance on these buses. With the ability to refuel quickly and to use one bus for an entire day of service, fuel cell electric buses offer the kind of operational equivalency the transit agencies are seeking as they go through this difficult transformation. There's also a resiliency built into having a multiplicity of suppliers. There are now well over a dozen different suppliers that are working in the hydrogen fuel space, including multiple very large industrial entities that are providing fuel to, to these agencies. Not only does that give them multiple supply vectors to ensure that the fuel keeps coming, but it also gives them kind of cost competitiveness that can drive prices down quite quickly. And it has to be noted that given that fuel cell buses have a very large energy capacity and can be refueled quickly even when the grid is down, these buses can conceivably provide a secondary power source in future microgrid enactments of transit agencies and in local resources where buses can provide a power resource when power is needed for critical facilities. These are being shown in the different rollout plans. And we can see with Bakersfield, they were quite bullish on, on fuel cell electric buses. In fact, their plan is 100% fuel cell electric bus, particularly with low floor buses. And they point out that operating one type of vehicle offers significant benefits to the agency. And it means that the buses are interchangeable and can be dis dispatched on any route as required. Long Beach identified this as well saying that more difficult routes with higher energy demands will be serviced by fuel cell electric buses, which have demonstrated longer range. Omnitrans also cites that for the specific routes which route modeling is identified as not being capable of being served by existing battery electric bus technology, they recommend that fuel cell electric buses be considered. Orange County now operating 10 fuel cell electric buses on their routes have dedicated themselves to what they're calling a all fuel cell electric bus transition plan. They also state that general battery electric bus operations would require coordination from other agencies to install charging infrastructure along bus routes, making operation more complicated and potentially affecting service reliability. San Joaquin RTD also points this out and points out 
their range concerns as well as power service reliability concerns. Challenges such as electricity cost and supply, operations in the event of a power failure, and the ability to provide demand for zero emission bus technology by 2040 are driving further research into alternative technology, including hydrogen fuel cells. Foothill most recently gave an update to their plan and they looked at a, an upcoming procurement for a number of zero emission buses. As they revisited the numbers with the most updated information, they found that in fact, they had a significant cost savings by buying a fuel cell electric bus fleet compared to a battery electric bus fleet. When they looked at the savings by being able to buy a fewer number of fuel cell electric buses, which could complete the entire duty cycles over the course of the day with a single vehicle, along with the savings in fueling infrastructure and the significant savings in midlife costs, these more than made up for the slight increase in fuel and maintenance costs and resulted in over a $12 million savings for a 20 bus deployment. So how did this shake out with these 10 agencies? Which way did they go? Did they choose an all fuel cell electric bus scenario? Did they designate batteries and fuel cells? Did they leave themselves open for either batteries or fuel cells? Or did they choose an all battery electric bus transition plan? We can see in the all fuel cell electric bus, as I previously mentioned, both Orange County and Bakersfield took on plans that they term as all fuel cell electric bus transition plans. AC Transit, Foothill Transit, Long Beach, North County, and Sunline all have plans to procure fuel cell electric buses, along with battery electric buses in their fleet, in their fleet to fulfill their ICT needs. Still holding their options open, but considering both battery electric bus and fuel cell electric bus are Omnitrans, Santa Monica, and San Joaquin RTD, who have left those future procurements open for either consideration as more information comes in from the field. Those agencies which so far have chosen an all battery electric bus solution, we haven't seen them yet. We'll see as more plans come in, but the evidence is starting to support that the value props that have been promised by fuel cell electric buses are in fact coming to fruition today. And here's how it plays out in the market. If we look at all the fuel cell electric buses that have been committed to, we're seeing over 900 that are gonna be procured between now and 2040. If we add in those buses, which might be procured as fuel cell electric buses converted to fuel cell, we're seeing over 1,600 of those fuel cell electric buses. And we'll see more to date come in as these plans get updated. And so we see as agencies take a total cost of ownership look at the fuel cell electric bus value proposition that is in fact compelling. It's more than just the operational efficiencies that are gained, it's in fact cost advantages that are making hydrogen and fuel cell technology the right choice for heavy duty in California. Thank you very much for your time.